Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. My name is Darren, pastor here, and so glad that you're with us uh, this morning. If you're visiting with us, we would be grateful if you take a moment and fill out a visitor's card. You'll find that in the seat pocket in front of you. We'd love to know a little bit more about you, ways that we can serve you. So uh, a means towards that would be exchanging some information there. Uh, you can take that visitor's card and put it in the offering plate as it comes by this morning, or you're welcome to hand that visitor's card uh, to me on your exit this morning. Thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, by way of announcement, if you would open up your uh, bulletin to page 16, uh, allow me to draw some attention to a few announcements there. Uh, first, College Plus Summer, uh, summer Sundays, uh, due to vacation... Uh, that's Tyler and Kristen Kenny. They're out of town. And due to illness, that's Taylor. Uh, there will be no College Plus gathering this week. And so, uh, although the Taylors would uh, love to see you, uh, if you show up today, they probably will not welcome you as uh, they're recovering from COVID at the moment. And so, um, with that, I want to do pray for uh, Clay and Leslie and the Taylor family. Uh, on page 17... Uh, a couple things to draw your attention to. You will, uh, and this is always a hard Sunday, because uh, you're going to continue to smell food throughout the worship service. Uh, and that's because today is fellowship lunch. And so I do want to invite you, if you're visiting, uh, whether or uh, you're a member of Regor t and and forgot, right? Uh, there's always plenty of food. Please stay. Uh, and we'd love to fellowship over a meal with you. Uh, that will be Im immediately after our morning worship service together. Uh, and, and, last, uh, and second to last, uh, do note there uh, as our summer projects, uh, this will be the last time you'll see this announcement in the bulletin. Uh, there are opportunities to help with that. So if you're not able to go uh, uh, on this summer's missions project to West Virginia, uh, you can participate not only in prayer, um, but also by potentially giving towards uh, scholarship needs for that, and you'll see information there on page 17. Uh, by way of reflection, uh, our New City Catechism question uh, this week is question 29. Uh, how can we be saved? Answer, only by faith in Jesus Christ and His substitutionary atoning death on the cross. So even though we are guilty of having disobeyed God, and are still inclined to all evil. Nevertheless, God, without any merit of our own, but only by pure grace, imputes to us the perfect righteousness of Christ when we repent and believe in Him. Let us pray together. Let me pray for us, and we'll stand for our call to worship. Father, uh, we do thank You for that great truth. Uh, Father, that in Christ Jesus, by repentance and faith, we are made fully righteous. And so we thank you that as your children, we have been made new and are precious in your sight. Father, we ask now that as your children, would you enable us through the work of your Spirit, through the truths of your Word, Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that you would lift our minds and lift our hearts to bring honor and praise and glory to your great name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand this morning for our call to worship. Our call to worship comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. I'll read the light print. Please respond uh, with the bold. For the word of the cross is fully to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God.
now come to our affirmation of faith, which we continue to use the questions from the Heidelberg Catechism. And you will see that the first question focuses upon misery. Well, we are reminded today that God is holy and we are not. Um, the text to support this discussion, this question, is Romans 3.20 which says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So I will ask the question, if you will please respond with the words printed in your bulletin in bold. From where do you know your misery? What does the law of God require of us? Can you keep all this perfectly? No, I am inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. Now we have an opportunity reflecting upon what we have just read to jointly together say the words that are printed as we, con um, we do our corporate prayer of confession. And then this will be followed by a time for our silent confession before our Heavenly Father. And of course, we will follow this with our assurance of pardon, which is the good news. Please join me. Gracious Heavenly Father, I am the worst sinner I actually know. Not anyone else but me. My sins are the worst sins I actually know anything about. My own hypocrisy, my own tempter, my own fears, my own loss, my own grudges, my own tongue. I am the worst sinner I actually know, and your son is the only hope, my only answer, my only confidence before you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you, the living God, are a forgiving God for all who are called by your name. Amen. Now hear our assurance of pardon, which comes from Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we now sing, God be merciful to me. We'll sing verses one, two, four, and five. seated. Uh, for our pastoral prayer this, this morning, we will be uh, praying for our West Virginia multi-generational missions project. Uh, as you are probably aware, a team from Emmanuel will be leaving next Saturday, most of them, uh, Saturday morning and traveling from here uh, to Fairmount, West Virginia. In West Virginia, they'll be uh, working with a church in that area. Uh, who reaches out to the needs of that community in mercy. Uh, and so we want to be praying for uh, this team that will be going in that direction. You'll notice it's a multi-generational team. Uh, we've got families going and we've got singles going uh, and uh, a lot of age groups uh, represented in that. Uh, and so let me lead us in prayer for that uh, team and project. Uh, Father, we come before you and we want to thank you uh, as I was reminded this morning that blessed are the feet that bring the good news of the gospel. And so, Father, we thank you for uh, this team and this project. And, Father, we do pray that uh, as they travel, you would grant them safety. Uh, Father, it is a long trip between here and West Virginia. And so uh, we pray for all those details uh, that a van trip entails for safety, for good driving. Uh, Father, we pray that you would keep them safe as they engage in projects, as they work uh, with their hands to serve the Fairmont community. And so, Father, we pray for safety. 
We pray for them as a team and uh, we are reminded in your word that we are called to love one another and uh, the mark of your being your disciples is that people would be able to see our love one for another. So we pray that uh, as they travel, as they work, as they worship, as they study, as they play, would their love for you and their love for each other blossom and grow. Father, we pray that the team would be quick to repent, quick to ask one another for forgiveness. Father, that all of the, uh, your commands in the Scriptures, you would enable them to love one another well. Father, we pray for uh, mercy, that as they uh, display your hands of mercy uh, into a community in need, as they move towards poverty, as they move towards brokenness. Father, would you give them minds and hearts to see every person created as your image bearer. And Father, we pray that you would give them words and uh, works that would restore the dignity uh, to each person of being made in your Image. But we also pray that as they display mercy through their actions, would you give them voice? Would you give them opportunity to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would you give them a willingness to listen to those that they minister to, to hear their story, and to have the wisdom and the discernment to know through your scriptures how the gospel applies into the lives of those they meet. Help them to love people well because they have been loved well in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for the privilege as a church of being a part of the, the gospel moving from the land to the ends of the earth. And so we pray that you'd bless this project for your honor, your glory, and our good. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we now sing Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor.
Father, we thank you that you are our sure anchor. And as your people, we ask now because you are an abundant and gracious and good God who gives us all that we need for life and godliness. So now as we return a portion of what's been given to us, we pray that you would bless our tithes and offerings. And Father, would you use them to expand your kingdom from the land to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stand for the doxology. As Claudia finished the offertory this morning, I heard a silent amen behind me. I just want to encourage you, it is okay for there to be a loud amen. Uh, sometimes we just need to be given permission, right? Uh, see, there you go. We express glory and thanksgiving to God for all that is beautiful, all that is true, that He has made and given uh, to us. And beautiful music is part of that. We continue this morning in our study of Mark's Gospel. We're in Mark uh, chapter 10. Uh, this morning our passage 
uh, sermon passages, verses 31 through 34, and then 43 through 45. Let's give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word uh, to His people and for us. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. After three days he will rise. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Open my eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we do pray and ask, as we have said, that you would open our eyes to behold the wonders of your word. Father, we ask now that you would give us spiritual eyes, uh, the eyes of your spirit that would enable us to see and would enable us to understand your word and to apply your word into our lives. And Father, your word is always a saving word. And so we ask that, Father, you would uh, tug and open the heart of one here today who does not know you, and you would bring them by repentance and faith into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, right, Peter's confession in chapter 8, you are the Christ, begins a significant shift in the ministry of Jesus. Prior to Peter's confession, the teaching and the works of Jesus, predominantly in the region of Galilee, had resulted in people being healed and people being astonished at His teaching. But there was uncertainty about His identity. As Mark makes clear at the opening of his gospel, he is writing to his readers about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is writing so that as we examine, as we experience the words and the works of Jesus through this gospel, we too would believe that Jesus is the Son of God who has come to redeem God's people from their sins. This is the reason. Mark is writing, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Mark has organized this gospel to reveal to us the King, to reveal to us His kingdom, and to call us to respond in repentance of sin and faith to King Jesus, and by Him enter into the kingdom of God. As we have noted previously, Peter's confession was right. Jesus is the Christ. He is the promised Messiah. But Peter and the other disciples lack spiritual discernment. They lack spiritual understanding to understand who Messiah truly is and what He had come to do. Since Peter's confession, the ministry of Jesus had been on a journey, had been on a journey from ending the ministry in Galilee and moving towards Jerusalem. As they've been moving from Galilee towards Jerusalem, the ministry of Jesus has focused on teaching and training up His disciples. Yes, He continues to engage with the crowds that follow but predominantly he is seeking to prepare his disciples for their future gospel ministry as it are, that is in the forefront of Jesus' mind and plans. The journey with Jesus had been a boot camp, if you will. Jesus had been leading and preparing his disciples for the road ahead, a pathway that would lead from 
suffering to glory. In response to Peter's confession in chapter 8, Jesus teaches His disciples that, and I quote, they, He must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Remember, Peter responds to this prophetic teaching of Jesus by pulling Jesus aside and, say, and rebuking Him. A suffering Messiah did not fit Peter or the disciples' theology or their plans. A second time in Mark 9, Jesus heals, when He heals a boy with an unclean spirit, uh, who some of the disciples had been unable to heal. Jesus not only heals the boy, but reveals through the healing of the boy's father as he cries, I believe, but help my unbelief. Through this interaction between Jesus, the boy, his father, and his disciples, it serves to reveal to the disciples that like the boy's father, they too are filled with unbelief as they had been dependent upon their own efforts to heal the boy and had not sought in prayer the power of God when their efforts were thwarted. As they leave the boy and his father in the journey, Jesus teaches again to his disciples, and I quote, is that Jesus is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him, and when they kill him after three days, he will rise. How did the disciples in John Mark 9 Uh, respond to this second prophetic uh, instruction of Jesus. They had an argument among themselves of who would be the greatest. As we'll see next week, the disciples respond to this third prophetic promise of Jesus with a question about their position in the kingdom of God. So let me ask, why the disconnect? Why don't they get it? Why don't they understand? Why does Jesus have to come and literally and yet in greater detail teach them the same lesson about who He is and what He's come to do and where is He going again? Perhaps like me, as we study through Mark's gospel, you are prone to shake your head. I shake my head at the disciples. The words of Jesus seem so simple, so clear. How don't they get it? I shake my head at the crowds. Do not the works of Jesus reveal His divine identity? I gasp at the Jewish leaders who have determined that Jesus is a threat to their reign and rule and must be eliminated. How evil their plan. How evil their purposes. As my shaking head slows and my gasp becomes a sigh, I realize that my own mind and my own heart are so often filled with unbelief. I realize that in my sin, Jesus is not the Redeemer that I want. His kingdom is not how I would design it. My sinful heart wants to be my own Redeemer. In pride, I want to reign and rule my own kingdom. A suffering king, a kingdom whose hierarchy is determined by who is the servant of all, is not one that my sinful heart wants. I have a plan My own glory is my own ultimate purpose. And in my kingdom, there is no place for suffering or passion. So as Jesus confronts and reveals to His disciples and to us His plan, His passion, and His purpose, may God grant us, may God grant me a heart of repentance and faith today to abandon my plans and to abandon my purposes and come to Jesus. Remember last week we saw with the rich young ruler that uh, he would not come and follow Jesus. With love and compassion, Jesus reveals to him his particular sin. 
and cause him to repent, sell all that he has to the poor, and come follow Jesus. And yet what? The rich young ruler departs, saddened, because he loves his possessions more than God, more than Jesus. He loves the kingdom of man more than the kingdom of God. He loves his plan. He loves his purposes more than the plans, passion, and purposes of Jesus. So as Jesus reveals in greater prophetic detail this morning, his plans, his passion, and his purposes, may God grant us his grace of repentance, faith, and following. Look at his plan. Jesus and the disciples are on the road. They're traveling from Judea towards Jerusalem. As Jerusalem is a city on a hill, the journey to Jerusalem is often described as going up to Jerusalem. This is the first time in Mark's gospel that Jerusalem is revealed as the destination for the journey. The religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees had come down from Jerusalem to listen to Jesus, to see Jesus. But now Jesus is leading the disciples to Jerusalem. Although Jerusalem is a holy city, the place where the temple of the Lord was, the place where God dwelt for His disciples, it is now a place of opposition. The Jewish religious leaders had formed an alliance with Herod and had been seeking to find reason, an opportunity to kill Jesus. The enemies of Jesus reside in Jerusalem. So we're told in our passage that the disciples and those that followed were afraid. The conspiracy against Jesus was becoming increasingly obvious. So in the mind of man, Jerusalem was a place to avoid not the destination for their journey. Jesus is leading His followers toward Jerusalem. This is not only affirming of sort of the rabbinic custom of the day where followers would be follow behind the rabbi to honor Him and to show their devotion to Him, but this reveals so much more. The disciples are amazed. Boldly, Jesus is leading them to Jerusalem They have failed to truly understand His plan, but His mission, the mission of Jesus must go through Jerusalem. So they follow with apprehension and amazement at the determination of Jesus. Jesus is not fixed on Jerusalem itself. He's not fixed on the conflict with religious leaders. He's determined to fulfill the will of His heavenly Father. He is the promised Messiah, the Son of God. He has come first and foremost to fulfill God's plans of redemption. He has come, as we see in verse 45, to give His life as a ransom for many. Jesus leads. Jesus speaks. Jesus acts always in accord with God's divine plan of redemption. So as Jesus is fixed on Jerusalem, The fulfillment of God's plan of redemption is at hand. The road to Jerusalem will lead to the cross. The cross uh, will lead to us seeing that the love and justice of God are met in Jesus to pay the ransom for God's people from slavery and to release us from sin and death. As Jesus leads, will we follow? Or do we linger behind in fear, staying a safe distance away in case things go bad? Are we astonished at His determination, but fearful of where He's going and where He's leading? The journey of redemption that Jesus must take is through the cross. Do we see His plan? Will we follow? Notice his passion, verses 33 and 34. He reveals his plan, but he also wants the disciples and us to know his passion, his suffering. First, his passion is not an accident, but part of God's plan of redemption. Jesus is telling his disciples what is going to happen to him, but we already know. 
He is telling them in advance so that they will understand that His suffering is part of God's plan and part of God's purpose. This is how the Apostle Peter will explain the passion of Jesus to the crowd in Jerusalem gathered at Pentecost after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus in Acts 2, 22-24. Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through Him in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised Him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for Him to be held by it. The suffering, the passion of Jesus is part of God's redemptive plan. It's according to His definite plan. It's according to His foreknowledge. In verse 33, Jesus defines Himself again as the Son of Man. As we've seen, Jesus uses this title from Daniel's visions to reveal but also define His identity. If you have a Bible, you could turn to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, where we see the Son of Man revealed in Daniel's vision. The Son of Man revealed in Daniel 7 is hinged between visions of beasts and the rulers of man. But listen here to Daniel 7, 13 through 14. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there was there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Notice... One like the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. Although man-like, He is clearly distinct. He comes with the clouds of heavens, a symbol of His divine authority. With divine authority and human likeness, the God-Man, Son of Man, comes into the presence of God, the Ancient of Days. He is presented before the Ancient of Days and He's given authority. He's given glory. He's given sovereign power. As one commentator notes, this is not delegated authority or power like given to the kings of men like Nebuchadnezzar in the context of of, of Daniel 7. For the Son of Man also receives what? Worship of all peoples, worship of all nations and languages. In a parallel to Daniel's vision in Revelation 5 and 7, the worthy and slain Lamb of God receives the worship and the honor as He purchased men for God from every tribe, nation, and peoples. Here in Daniel 7, the Son of Man is given an everlasting and indestructible dominion, a sovereignty that belongs to God Himself. Daniel's vision of the glorious Son of Man who is both human and divine, focuses on the divine glory, the divine power and sovereignty of the Son of Man. As Jesus travels towards Jerusalem, He's teaching His disciples that the glorious Son of Man will be delivered over to His enemies to fulfill God's plan of redemption. The focus is not on His divine nature, but on His human nature as He will fulfill all righteousness as the second Adam. Ian Duguid summarizes it this way. For the disciples, the lesson that Jesus was the Son of Man focused on the humanity of Jesus. They had to learn that salvation does not come through the advent of a triumphal heavenly figure bearing a sword, blasting His opponents with fire from heaven. Rather, it comes through the advent of a babe, born in a manger, who grew up to bear a crown of thorns and carries a cross. The Son of Man had come to be not to be served, but rather to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. End quote. The glorious Son of Man 
the one worthy of the worship of all peoples and all nations will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death. And his prophetic, previous prophetic instructions to his, to his disciples in chapter 8, Jesus identifies the Jewish religious leaders as enemies. He will cause him to suffer and will reject him and kill him. But here in Mark 10, the religious leaders will condemn Jesus to death. For Jesus to begin, be condemned to death under the Jewish leaders, He must be found guilty of breaking the law of God. Not only of breaking the law of God, but breaking the law as it relates to a capitable offense, punishable by death. Implied is that Jesus will be accused. Jesus will be tried. Jesus will be found guilty of lawlessness. Lawlessness is so heinous against the Word of God that He will be punished by death. Yet, since in the Roman Empire only the state had the power to carry out a sentence of death, Jesus predicts that He will also be turned over and delivered over to the Gentiles. To be delivered over to the Gentiles is more than political maneuvering. For the Jew, this was being cast outside of the camp being excommunicated from the covenant community of God's people. Jesus, Jesus would be thrown out. He would be delivered over to the Gentiles. He would be treated like a pagan. He had no rights in Israel, no standing among God's covenant peoples. At the hands of His Gentile enemies, Jesus will be mocked, spit on, flogged. And killed. Jesus will be verbally abused, bullied, assaulted, insulted, cursed against, all these hurled against him. He will be mocked. Jesus will be spit on. He will be humiliated as he's treated as less than human. Spit was viewed as human waste, all that it fell on was unclean. Jesus would be flogged, scourged. He will be beaten. He will be whipped. He will be physically punished. He will be tortured. He will be dismantled. Jesus will be killed, executed at the hands of His Gentile enemies. Jerusalem will bring untold horrors and injustice Yet with amazing resolve, in full knowledge of what awaits him, Jesus strides towards Jerusalem. Why? With amazing precision and fulfillment, as we will see in the future study of the Gospel of Mark, every prediction of Jesus is fulfilled. By the hands of Judas, he will be delivered over to the Jewish leaders. Jesus is falsely accused, unfairly tried, condemned to death by the Jewish leaders. He's delivered over to the Gentiles under the rule of Pilate and Herod. Jesus is mocked, spit on, flogged, and executed on a cross. Jesus wants His disciples and Jesus wants us to know in advance that His suffering is part of God's plan of redemption. He wants us to understand that although He is the divine Son of God, the Son of Man, He will exercise His power, He will exercise His sovereignty by submitting Himself to death on a cross. Why? His plan, His passion, His purpose will fulfill God's promised plan of redemption the salvation of God's people for their sins. Jesus will suffer. He will suffer willfully to ransom us, to pay the price to rescue us from the curse of sin. His purpose. And after three days, He will rise. 
the resurrection from the dead will vindicate Jesus from the condemnation, the wrong condemnation of death. Not only will the resurrection reveal that He was falsely accused and wrongly executed by the hands of men, but His resurrection will overthrow the reign and rule of Satan and the ultimate curse of sin. Death will be no more for God's people. Through His resurrection, Jesus will demonstrate His authority, power, and sovereignty over death and the devil. Jesus will reveal His perfect righteousness that cannot be contained by death. Through His perfect life, death, resurrection, Jesus will save His people from their sins. He will serve them by suffering the punishment for sin that they deserve. He will make Himself last so that God's people may be redeemed and go first. Why? Ultimately to save God's people from their sins. Three applications. Jesus wanted His disciples to know and to understand what would happen to Him in Jerusalem. But more importantly, why? He reveals to them again His plan, His passion, His purpose a third time so the disciples will see, so they will understand their need for redemption and thus our need for redemption and Jesus as well. Last week as Jesus was unpacking His conversation with the rich young ruler, with His disciples, they commented, then who can be saved? In their view, the rich young ruler, this young man, this successful young man, this religious man, this good man, this pious man, if he's not able to be saved through his own efforts, then who can be saved? Jesus' answer is simple. With man... It's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. Salvation belongs to the Lord. As they journey to Jerusalem, Jesus wants us to see God's impossible plan of redemption being fulfilled in Himself. Jesus is teaching us that redemption is the ultimate part of His plan, the plan of God, not the plan of man. Jesus will suffer and die for us, but even more for you. Jesus wants us to know that He will be falsely accused, unfairly tried, and wrongly condemned to death for you. Jesus wants you to know that He will be cast out of the camp. He will be excommunicated from God's people for you. Jesus will be mocked. Jesus will be spit on. Jesus will be flogged for you. Jesus will be crucified, publicly humiliated in a horrific death for you. Jesus will die for you. Jesus will rise from the dead for you. You, His victory, His salvation by repentance and faith can be your salvation and can be your victory today. So how will you respond today to His plan, His passion, and His purpose? Will you say yes in repentance and faith? We're called to follow. Jesus tells His disciples in advance His plans, His passion, and His purpose so that they would not fear and so that they would be prepared to join Him in expanding His gospel ministry to the ends of the earth as His faithful witnesses. Jesus is preparing His disciples for the day when He will ascend to His Father's right hand and entrust His ministry to them. And trust them to proclaim in word and deed the good news of His gospel. To call people from every tribe, nation, and language to repent. And to call them to faith in King Jesus. 
Jesus wants them to know that as His disciples face trials and suffering for His name's sake and for the gospel, they can take courage because God's plans and purposes are sure. In the same manner, Jesus wants us to know His plans, His passion, and His purposes so that we would not fear and that we would join Him as His children in in proclaiming and living out the good news of the King and His kingdom we're called to follow. Lastly, Christian brothers and sisters, perhaps Jesus is reminding us today that His plan, His passion, His purposes must come first. Our passage today serves as a sober reminder of how costly our salvation was to God. The good news is that Jesus paid the price for our redemption. He paid it in full. It has been fully satisfied and paid through His suffering and resurrection. Our hearts should soar today in wonder and praise to God for His grace, for His love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, in Christ, we're being confronted with the reality and the presence of sin in our lives when our plans and our purposes interfere or they take greater priority over His plans and His purposes. How should we respond? We should repent and turn and walk after His plans, His passion, and His purposes. May His plans, may His passion, and may His purposes be ours, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us pray. Father, that is our prayer. Uh, We ask that uh, as Your people, we would take on Your plans and purposes for us, which have been purchased by the passion of Your Son, King Jesus. Father, we pray that where our minds and our hearts and our lives are not in alignment with Your redemptive purposes, would You show us and give us Your grace of repentance and faith. Father, we need to ask that You would help us to follow, remove our fear, and give us courage to walk and to follow the path our Lord and Savior trod. Father, if we are not in Christ today, Oh, would you show us the beauty, the wonder, and our need for the plans and passions and purpose of Jesus to save us from our sins, that we may call on the name of Jesus and be saved. In whose name we pray, amen. A quick instruction about our next song. Um, After the third verse, we'll repeat the refrain one more time, but you can ignore the last line of music on the second page and just refer back to the top of that page. So let's stand and sing together, Christ our hope in life and death.
you cannot sing that chorus with joy, I would love for you to be able to do that. I'd love for you to be able to tell you about uh, Jesus, our hope in life and death. Uh, I'll be in the breezeway for a, a little bit of time as we exit this morning for those who will be leaving and not joining us for fellowship lunch, and that is to your pity and shame. <laughs> I do want to encourage you. Yes, sometimes we have other plans, but I want to encourage you to join us for lunch. Whether you plan to be here or you didn't plan to be here, just stay. There'll be plenty of food. Love the fellowship with you. Uh, if you're visiting, we're honored to have you here. Thank you so much for your visit this morning. Uh, a few housekeeping things, and let me pray for lunch before our benediction. Housekeeping. Parents, please help your kids go through the food line. Uh, we will go by Harper Rules. If it, if it hits your plate, you got to eat it. Okay? But we do want to be considerate uh, of others around us. So let's help uh, our younger members uh, make sure they don't start at the dessert line perhaps <laughs> that's just simply for my benefit uh, also let me pray for us pray for our lunch father we we do thank you uh, for your spiritual food that we have feasted on as your people the feasting uh, uh, the prophet declares that I found your word and I ate it and so father we thank you for uh, feeding us through your word and now, as we go and partake of uh, physical food, we ask that you would nourish us and that you would bless it. But more importantly, would you bless our time together? Would we leave here having been encouraged not only by what we've eaten, but by the fellowship of our brothers and sisters in Christ? Give us true communion with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.